Coming up in today's newscast, four of the five Jewish teen terror suspects allegedly responsible for stoning to death a Palestinian woman are released to house arrest. A new Twitter hashtag reveals just how widespread anti-Semitism really is, and the oldest standing synagogue in Washington, D.C. gets moved. The Rishon LeZion District Court ordered the release on Thursday of four out of the five Jewish minor terror suspects currently detained by the Shin Beit Security Services. The four minors were released to house arrest with the fifth suspect to remain in custody. The suspects are alleged to have killed Palestinian woman and mother of seven, Aisha Raubi, who was killed in October after having been hit in the head by rocks while driving in the car with her husband and daughter in the West Bank. Itamar ben Gvir, an attorney for one of the suspects, criticized the authorities and said, I don't understand how the prosecutors allowed these arrests, adding that his client was traumatized by the Shin Bet interrogation that lasted nearly two weeks, and that he expected the Shin Bet to do some soul searching. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, the right-wing legal aid organization representing the minors, Honenu, said that the police raided the Pri Haaretz Yeshiva where the five minors studied and handed out summons to around 80 yeshiva students to represent themselves for questioning regarding the incident. Over 30 of the 80 students have already been questioned in preliminary inquiries. Honenu then slammed security forces as well, calling the raid illegal and demanding that Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan wake up and put a stop to the trampling of the rights of children in educational institutions. Since details of the case were made public, the Shin Beit has come under a great deal of scrutiny in what's been called a targeted smear campaign by interested parties, even prompting Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to issue a public statement in support of the organization this past week. Further, after security forces apprehended the terrorists responsible for the Givat Asaf and Ofra murders, Netanyahu also praised the Shin Bet, saying that it's the best counterterrorism organization of its kind in the world. We owe it a great deal. It performs professionally and morally. There is no room to attack it. In similar news, the IDF announced on Thursday that military police arrested four IDF soldiers and one officer who allegedly beat two Palestinian suspects that were in their custody. The five soldiers from the Kfir Brigade's religious Netzach Yehuda battalion will now be brought before a military court on Thursday to face charges. The military police is investigating whether the soldiers acted out of revenge for the shooting attack in Givat Asaf last month that killed two soldiers from their battalion, Sergeant Yosef Cohen and Staff Sergeant Yovel Mor Yosef. But Asim Barghouti, who is believed to have carried out the attack, was captured by Israeli security forces on Tuesday after a week's-long manhunt. And Balkuti is also suspected of being involved with his brother Salih in another shooting, which left seven Israelis injured. Among them, a seven months pregnant woman whose baby was delivered in an emergency operation only to die days later. The Shin Beit said Balkuti was preparing to carry out additional terror attacks in the near future as well, and he was arrested in a joint Shin Beit, IDF, and Yamam operation, which captured additional accomplices as well. While the IDF did not provide details on the arrest of the five soldiers, though, the incident is believed to have occurred at the same time of the takedown of Balkuti and his accomplices. Prime Minister Netanyahu has twice now submitted requests to the State Comptroller's Permits Committee to secure funding for his legal fees from wealthy friends and associates, specifically his cousin Nathan Milikowski and American businessman Spencer Partridge. But new reports today reveal that Milikowski had already given Netanyahu $300,000, despite Netanyahu's first funding request being rejected and his second request still pending. The first funding request was reportedly rejected for a number of reasons, including that the benefactors in question, both Partridge and Milikowski, were questioned by police in the corruption probe Case 1000, one of the three cases against the prime minister. And Case 1000, ironically, is also in regards to suspicions of accepting lavish gifts. Another reason was that the request simply lacked pertinent information, like how much money was being requested, how much had already been given, and for which cases the money was intended to be partitioned. This is what prompted Netanyahu's legal team to resubmit the request earlier this week with added information. But according to Aharet's reports, buried within the 25-page document resubmitted to the Permits Committee, the Prime Minister's attorney included that Netanyahu had already acquired $300,000 from Milikowski to pay for his and his wife Sarah's legal fees. Further, the date of the payment was not included. Regardless, though, the payment is thought to be illegal. So now, should the Permits Committee reject this latest submission, they'll likely have to open an investigation into this latest payment as well. Earlier this week, the United States Senate failed to pass a major bill that included legislation for combating the anti-Israel BDS movement. But the bigger news about the Senate vote is really on how the new Democratic Party seems more and more divided by the day when it comes to the Jewish state. 
Well, joining us now with more is former chairman of the United States Democratic Party in Israel, Sheldon Shore. Sheldon, thank you very much for coming back and joining Pleasure. us on TV again. All right, so first of all, you know, what are your initial reactions to the failure to pass the legislation earlier this week and the alleged divide with the, within the Democratic Party? All right, first of all, let's understand that the, there was legislation. In other words, there was a proposal to do two things. First of all, to reinforce the, uh, Obama's promise to make 10 years of $36 billion available to Israel, so that's a pro-Israeli thing. And also, there was a provision in there to fight against BDS. Sure. Right. So, and, and the Democratic Party supported this bill. All right. It did not pass. All right. So one of the reasons, wait, if the Democratic Party supported this bill, it supported the first part of the bill, mm. but it, the second part has some problems. There are some questions about what. Uh, all right. So, Sam, Bernie Sanders said, for example, why bring this up right now? Why should this be the very first bill of the new Congress? Shouldn't we do something about the government first? Or there was another question about whether uh, being a, a BDS, anti-BDS bill inflicts on the, the Bill of Rights. There was a freedom of speech, and here oh. you're, you're impeding on the freedom of speech. So that portion was controversial. But, so, but, well, but, but the bill was brought up. That was the first thing sure. that was interesting. So I think well, it's again, important. Well, again, okay, so, but, so to answer the first you know, hypothetical there that, that uh, Bernie Sanders, Senator Sanders brought up, you know, why not now? What does it matter that it was the first bill or the 50th bill that was introduced uh, on the Senate well, floor. Well, should address something about the cl government closure. That seems to be the, the sure. biggest problem. Sure, but why, why would that preclude, why, you know, no, why? No, no, it, it's, it's a side point, but there, the, the point is that this is a pro-Israel proposal, okay? The Democratic Party, as you remember, the platform of uh, two years ago, of uh, 2016, said specifically that the Democratic Party opposes any effort to de delegitimize Israel, including at the United Nations, or through the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. Sure. But now we have, uh, again, what many uh, would characterize as a new face within the Democratic Party. You have a, a new senators. Uh, who, who have been elected, who like Rashida Tlaib, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who have made many statements that are questionable at best with right. respect to, well, to the Democratic policy. They're congressmen, policy. and they're four upstarts, and they're, they're fresh new voices there. Mm -hmm. And yes, many of them are uh, against Israel or are in favor of the Palestinians. That's a legitimate okay. political position. Okay, but again, so now let's look back, okay, then at Bernie Sanders's uh, second issue that you, that you raised, which is with respect to uh, you know issues of uh, infringing on the First Amendment freedom of speech. In what way did it infringe on in First Amendment freedom of speech? Because this was about economic sanctions or preventing economic sanctions, really, uh, against the Jewish state. It had, really had nothing to do with people's individual freedom of speech. Well, no, it's uh, if you're if to pass legislation preventing people to propose to say let us boycott. What if you get up and you say I want to boycott Israel? That's freedom of speech. That's sure. a political position. Well, but he's referring to the right of people to, to engage in political activity. And in what way did this bill prevent that? Well, no, it's, what it said was that states are allowed to do this sort of legislation. There, it, it's a bit controversial. But what bothers me more, there is a division, as they started to say at the beginning, mm -hmm. in the Democratic Party. We saw this during the 2016 election, the resurgence of, uh, of uh, Bernie Sanders and his group, the, the far left, against Hillary Clinton. Now, the party today still is more of the old guard. It is still led by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is still very pro-Israel, and sure. it's only we're talking about a few small, a few people who are now four new members of the House of uh, Representatives who are uh, coming this. But it does display a trend. It does display that there is a, a far left in America who is uh, represented by the Democratic Party, by some new voices. And we don't know whether this will be the voice of the future or, the, uh, or uh, whether or not uh, this is just an out thing. There's the, the fact that the, some Arabs were, were elected, this is also nothing new. Well, so there have been many Arab representatives sure. before. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong there's with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Right. I think that, uh, again, though, I think the you know, question that you just raised is, you know, you're talking about the old guard versus the new guard and the face of, you know, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Israel, what, what have you. But if you combine these, you know, I guess the, the next question is, is the Democratic Party doing anything to change that? Because when the old, old guard is removed or leaves office, retires, etc. As I said, I don't know whether the the next phase, the next elections, will see more of these four people who came in, or whether or not this is just an aberration that happened because of specific things that went on in their particular districts at the time. I don't. I think that still the Democratic Party as uh, is very much pro-Israel. So how? 
you know, do you have any maybe uh, some advice for the Democratic Party if they're listening today, you know, of how to maybe address this issue? Because regardless of whether or not there is an issue, there is an it's perceived that there is an issue. Yeah, well, I'll tell and you, perception is, it goes a lot further than, than you, facts these days. It actually goes uh, beyond the Democratic Party as well. It goes into the American Jewish community as well. And the Democratic Party, when they are, you know, when they're speaking for American uh, Americans and American Jews, and look, and they get a clue from them. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a growing division between American Jews and Israeli Jews on on the issue of Israel, where America, many American Jews today are becoming less. It is, uh, disenchant is becoming disenchanted with Israel, becoming more American, more leftist, and you and you see a division between the American, the, the snap support for Israel that you saw 50 years ago doesn't exist today among the American Jewish community. And that is reflected also in the, in the uh, Congress as well. So what is, how is that going to play out? And will there be a reconciliation? Will there be more openness? It's 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 hard to tell. It's a very disturbing and very unsettling thing for me as an American, as an American Israeli, and also a uh, supporter of the Democratic Party to see these divisions happening. And I hope that the issues will be addressed head on and dealt with. All right. Well, I support you uh, with that sentiment uh, that these issues should absolutely be uh, dealt with head on. Sheldon, thank you so much for coming in. Okay, pleasure. The Israeli Knesset on Wednesday gave final approval over the appointments of two new ministers following the appearance of the vacancies in the wake of the calls for elections. As of now, Yoav Galant will be immigration minister and Yifat Shasha Biton will be the housing minister. The two were sworn in immediately after the vote last night. Now the two new ministers will only be in their positions until the election in April, plus the time it takes to transfer the portfolios to any new appointees. This unless, of course, they're reappointed within the new coalition. But at any rate, the shifting in ministerships isn't that wild to begin with. Yoav Galant, who is now the immigration minister, was formerly the housing minister until last week when he resigned both from his post and from the Kulanu party. He's since joined the Likud and will be running for a position within their party primaries next month. The immigration portfolio used to belong to Israel Beitenu, but defaulted to Likud after former defense minister and Israel Beitenu party leader Avigdor Lieberman resigned and pulled out of the coalition. Then, since the housing portfolio, which belongs to Kulanu, was left open by Galant, Shasha Biton of the Kulanu party was appointed to take up the role. Despite their short terms, however, both Shasha Biton and Galant have indicated their full attention, with Shasha Biton tweeting, Time is short and there is much work, adding that she intends to serve with 100% dedication to 100% of the public for 100% results. Just days after Shin Bet head Nadav Argaman announced potential hacking in the upcoming elections, the intelligence chief is now adding to his red alert that China may be gaining a little too much influence in the Jewish state. According to a Channel 10 News report Wednesday, Argoman reportedly said at Tel Aviv University that Chinese influence in Israel is particularly dangerous in terms of strategic infrastructure and investments in larger companies. He added that there are dangerous gaps in Israeli law allowing for foreign investment to subvert national security. For example, Agamon pointed again to China in that Chinese companies are scheduled to soon oversee operations at the Haifa uh, shipping port uh, and is helping to construct the Tel Aviv light rail, among other things. Further, large Israeli companies are often being bought up by Chinese firms like Israeli food company Tnuva. Indeed, even the United States and other foreign powers have asked Israel to take a closer look at their dealings with foreign powers, threatening even to stop docking at Haifa if the port deal goes through. And during his meetings with Israeli officials this week, United States National Security Advisor John Bolton asked that a harsher position be taken against ZTE and Huawei specifically, two major Chinese electronics firms. In response, according to Haaretz, Israeli government officials are reportedly already looking into new protective legislation, having convened a special committee on Chinese economic involvement this week. Additionally, the finance ministry in 2016 and 2017 blocked deals from Chinese firms trying to purchase Israeli insurance companies Klal and Phoenix. And last year, it was reported that a team of economic and security advisors were tasked with creating a tool to assess the threat of external factions in Israel's critical local markets and infrastructure. A Jerusalem district court on Thursday has just sentenced 30-year-old Arab-Israeli citizen Mohammed Jamal Rashada to 11 years in prison. Rashada was arrested in April 2018 in suspicion of planning to assassinate Prime Minister Netanyahu and then-Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat on orders from a Syrian-based terror group, the PFLP General Command. Two other accomplices were also allegedly arrested a few weeks later, though the Shin Beit still has refused to identify them.
Now, according to the Shin Bet Security Services, in addition to Netanyahu and Balkat, Rashada was also supposedly targeting the United States Embassy building in Jerusalem, as well as a delegation of Canadian security experts who were coming to train Palestinian Authority security forces. Thankfully, though, the attacks were only in the planning stages, so before any attack was actually carried out, Rashada was arrested in his hometown of the Shuafat refugee camp in East Jerusalem. Then finally, after months uh, in court, Rashada reportedly agreed to a plea bargain in which he was charged with espionage, conspiracy to murder, aiding the enemy in times of war, and more. At the time of the arrests last year, Mayor Barkat, uh, one of Rashada's targets, praised the Shin Bet forces for being one of the best in the world, as well as keeping him updated with respect to the handling of the threat in real time. He said he could trust them and sleep soundly. Further, the Shin Bet said that in a statement, the uh, arrests of the suspects thwarted significant terror attacks, which the cell had been requested to advance. The cell was a part of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, which split off from the original PFLP in 1968, resettling in the north in Syria. Racism and anti-Semitism in sports is unfortunately nothing new. And now, according to an AFP report, Italian police started a new investigation after Roma fans had allegedly distributed anti-Semitic posters targeting Roma's rival teams of Lazio and Napoli. ATV's Joy Gavigione is here with more on the story. Thanks, Aaron. So as you said, uh, these kind of inc incidents, especially when it comes to soccer, are not new at all. And once again, in Italy. This time, and according to, AFP, to the AFP report, supporters of the soccer team Roma allegedly distributed leaflets attacking the rivals. But not only that, they also compared them to Israel. Uh, and the poster said, uh, in these words, Lazio, Napoli and Israel, same colors, same flags. And I won't repeat the last word because everyone can see it in the picture. All right, well, for those who, who didn't see the picture or don't speak Italian, the word is synonymous with feces. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is really disgusting. It's, and it's very sad. Yes, actually. it's actually very sad. But the truth is that soccer is the game that, because of some extremist groups within their supporters, it's tainted with violence and even anti-Semitism. All these posters were signed by a group from the Ultras, uh, Roma Ultras, and were placed in an area where Lazio supporters gathered for the team's anniversary celebrations. An event that, by the way, ended up in violent clashes with the police. All right. Well, so as we said before, this is not new, unfortunately, anti-Semitism in yes. sports. Uh, and we have reported actually about similar situations in the past. But it seems like despite all the efforts, uh, you know, against it, incidents are only getting worse. Yes. And this new incident comes only, as you say, we have heard it on the past. And it comes only one year after another one that took place in Italy also and had repercussions worldwide for using Anne Frank's picture. In October 2017, Lassie supporters posted stickers of a photoshopped Anne Frank wearing Roma's jersey and alongside the picture there were anti-Semitic slogans saying Roma fans are Jews. After the fact, the team was fined, of course, and in the following uh, round of games, a passage from Anne Frank's diary was read as a decision made by the Italian Football Federation. But All right. And, and what about this latest incident then? Well, the mayor of Rome, Virginia Raghi, posted on Twitter that she firmly condemns the posters, but there hasn't been any word on possible sanctions or preventing measures, just the police investigation. All right, well, hopefully the police investigation will lead to those responsible, yeah. but uh, more than anything, I hope that the authorities can just find a way to address this issue in order to prevent it from happening again, uh, and against, you know, any group, really. You know, I never understood how or why sports being simple competitions of strength and strategy ever became synonymous with you know, racism and bigotry. And, it's and hard how, to understand. Yeah, like where these things combine, I don't get it. Yeah. Um, but thank you for your report, Joy. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks to the wonders of social media, a new hashtag on Twitter is revealing just how prominent and worrisome anti-Semitism really is. Rabbi Tzvi Solomons, the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berkshire in the UK, started the hashtag first anti-Semitic experience when he tweeted out and asked Jews to share their stories. And the stories have come in. Thousands of Twitter users from around the world responded with stories about bullying, attacks, and exclusion just for being Jewish. And some were recent and some older, but all left a lasting impression. Twitter user at M. Lewis Lawyer wrote, quote, Age 5 having a squabble with a boy in my street. His mother comes out and says, Shame Hitler didn't finish you all off. I had to ask my parents who he was. She was a teacher at an RC school. Adam Ma'anit said he had pennies thrown at him in class when he was just eight years old, followed by a swastika carved on his desk, and he added that a few days later I was beaten mercilessly by a gang of six boys who then dumped me in a rubbish bin to simulate putting me in an oven. What's worse is that while these stories may sound shocking, the hashtag revealed that they're all too common. 
at Truth and Fiction journalist Annika Rothstein shared that she was tormented for three years in school until she ended up shaving off her big curly hair, hoping to hide her Jewishness. And Shai De Luca shared that he attended the March of the Living walking through the streets of Poland wrapped in flags of Israel when a young kid no more than 15 years old stood behind the barricade with a switchblade, looked him in the eye, and said, quote, next time it's all of you, end quote. Finally, others shared experiences which include being checked for horns, verbal assaults, accusing Jews of killing Christ, and of course, making Holocaust jokes. The Adas Israel Synagogue in Washington, D.C., first built in 1876, is the oldest standing synagogue in the American nation's capital, and it's stood proudly there at 2850 Quebec Street ever since, until now. But it's not been destroyed. No, in order to preserve the structure and to protect it from damage due to nearby construction, Adas Israel, the whole of it, is being moved down the street. No, this is quite, a, quite an urban spectacle. We're actually moving this historic building. It's the first synagogue that was built in Washington, D.C. And we are moving it down the street um, to the corner of 3rd and F, where it's going to become the centerpiece of the new Capitol Jewish Museum. The brick and mortar building was first loaded Wednesday onto a massive platform that's motorized and mobilized with dozens of wheels. And moving crews laughed and joked as they escorted the synagogue down the road. It's fascinating from an engineering and technical standpoint, and we still have our fingers crossed. You know, they, there's still a lot of work to be done. And despite just moving down the street to the corner of 3rd and F, it's still a technical marvel, taking hours to complete. They were telling us maybe four to six hours, although I think we're about to get run over. <laughs> Finally, upon arrival, the plan for the historic structure is to be joined with the Lillian and Albert Small Capital Jewish Museum. It's scheduled to open in 2021 and will focus on the rich history of Jewish American life in D.C. It's good. Real yeah. good, yeah. No worries. No, everything's going real nice. And up now we have ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh with this week's Top 5. I'm here to give you guys ILTV's Top 5 list of upcoming events to get super excited about for 2019. In order. First up is the Tel Aviv Marathon, set for February 22nd, 2019. This annual event holds a series of running events, including full marathon, half marathon, 10 and five kilometer run, as well as a 42 kilometer hand cycle race for people with special needs. With more than 35,000 runners, this has to be one of the biggest sporting events of the year. Can't wait to watch and cheer from the side. Second up on the list, the early election, set for April 9th of the new year. In a landmark speech in, on Monday evening, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his coalition partners agreed to dissolve their government and the parliament with it, which means get ready to be informed and get out to vote. Third up is the ever so talked about Eurovision Song Contest, being hosted by none other than our home country on May 14th. The winner of the previous year's contest is the host of the following year, which means due to Neta Balzilai's win in 2018, Tel Aviv can start getting excited to host the 2019 Eurovision Song Competition. And let me tell you, I'm already getting ready. Fourth is one of my absolute favorite events, the Tel Aviv Gay Pride Parade, set for June 14th. It's that time of year when the city comes to life. Tons of vi vibrate colors cover the streets and beautiful people running around everywhere. With hundreds of thousands of stunning humans coming to Tel Aviv just for this, we have one of the largest pride parades in the world. You don't want to miss this. Last but never least is Bon Jovi. Set to perform July 25th, the American rock band is currently on their European tour, This House Is Not For Sale, and are set to hit Pal Kayokon's stage this coming summer, which will be their first performance in Israel since 2015. This may be a good time to look for your tickets, people. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. And now for our Hebrew Word of the Day. The oldest synagogue in Washington, D.C. has just literally been lifted to a new location. So today's word is to lift or le'arim. Usually, though, when people ma'arimim or lift something, it's much smaller. For example, when you pick up or marim a piece of fruit to eat. That being said, growing up in my household, I was much more likely to hear tarimidze, meaning pick that up. And it was also typically clothing and such, and not fruit. Thankfully, I picked up, or heramti, some much better habits since then. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 46 or 8 degrees Celsius. And then over the weekend, you can expect clear to partly cloudy skies and a rise in temperatures to a high of around 66 or 19 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.67 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.